Beloved community, won't you pray with me? Loving God, we thank you for bringing these texts into our lives today. And we ask that you illuminate our hearts and our minds so that we, we may more clearly grasp your intentions and your hopes for us. We pray for this in your name. Amen. So we find ourselves in one of the harder psalms to read, Psalm 22. It's about isolation, hopelessness, loss, loneliness, told in very sensory and somatic language, language of the body, language of pain and fear and ridicule and exhaustion. It's one of the harder psalms to read, but it's also, from my perspective and from conversations with others, one of the more relatable psalms that speaks to this universal condition of grief and isolation. Isn't that interesting? When we're down or angry or frustrated, we may connect much more to Psalm 22 than to one of the more uplifting psalms of praise. Psalm 22 is a beautifully written but grotesquely presented representation of what grief and separation does do to the body. Let's hear that 14th verse again. I am like water draining away. My bones are all disjointed. My heart is like wax melting inside of me. I remember taking a, a course on the Psalms with one of my professors and mentors, Dr. Carl Plank, an undergrad, and feeling stuck in class as we read this verse. I had never heard hard feelings described in this way. I am like water draining away. My bones are all disjointed. My heart is like wax melting inside of me. Have you ever had such a strong emotion that you can physically feel it in your body, taking root in your lungs and your chest like the psalmist, or maybe your head or your gut? For me, I feel emotions behind my eyes usually. When I read, the ver when I read this verse, this line, my heart is like wax melting inside of me, I picture the Psalter's heart as a house of wax that has just been lit, destroyed, collapsing in on itself, waiting to be reformed. The lectionary paired Psalm 22, a psalm of lament, which is actually the largest category of psalms in that book, with a short five-verse passage from Hebrews that doesn't really seem to have much to do with the meltdown type of feelings we hear in the psalms passage. Hebrews 4, in contrast, feels logical, steadfast, cut and dry, and confident. Total, tonal shift from what we just heard. The imagery of these passages are also very different. We have, on one hand, melted wax collapsing in on itself, versus a sharp and sure sword, like something from the King Arthur tales. Of course, their historical settings are different as well. The Psalms were written hundreds of years before Jesus. So why did the lectionary put these two texts together? Despite their differences, I'd like to invite you to consider the possibility that these texts are, in fact, intentionally put together, speaking to each other. We know that Jesus quotes Psalm 22, this passage we've been studying today as he dies on the cross in the Gospel of Matthew and Gospel of Mark. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those are, that's the first verse of Psalm 22. In our second Wednesday Bible study last week, we read over these texts, and one of our theologians, as I like to call us, because we are, pointed out that Psalm 22 psalmist enemies mock him, just like Jesus' enemies mocked him before his death. It's not uncommon to find parallels and references from one book of the Bible to another, from one century or millennial, millennia to another. What else is similar about these texts? Although they're historically different, their audience actually shares some commonalities. The psalmist laments because he's afraid, he's being persecuted, he feels separated from hope, the threat of war and empire encroaches upon his very being, his religious, social, and cultural identities. Does any of this sound familiar? The story of the psalmist might sound like those of the early Christian or Christ-following communities in the Roman Empire. In fact, some Bible scholars believe that the letter to the Hebrews was written for Jewish Christians who lived in Jerusalem, 
who were, like the psalmist, anxious and afraid of attacks on their identities. With this context, I'd like us to zoom in and narrow our focus to two particular sections of these texts. So we already know this one well by now, but again from Psalm 22, verse 14. I am like water draining away. My bones are all disjointed. My heart is like wax melting inside of me. And let's pair that with the opening verses from the New Testament passage. From Hebrews 4, 12 through 13, the epistler, which is just a fancy word for letter writer, says, God's word is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It pierces so deeply that it divides even soul and spirit, bone and marrow, and is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Nothing is concealed from God. All lies bare and exposed before the eyes of the one to whom we have to render an account. So the psalmist lays out all of his despair and anger and gives it to God. And if we read the lectionary text in order, the Hebrews epistler seems to respond to the psalmist. What does he say? God already knows. God has already seen the hurt, the rejection, the loneliness. Nothing is concealed from God. All lies bare and exposed. So here's what I think is at the core of each of these passages and why they were put together. It seems in conversation they are telling us there is nothing too painful, too scary, too sad that we can't hide from God. God can see through us, might be a little disconcerting or comforting, through every little piece of what we try to conceal. God can tolerate, even encourage, our heart melting like wax, our gripes, our worries, our anxieties, our grief, ready to combust, explode, and melt down. God's wisdom can turn us inside out and tear us apart in the best way possible, dividing soul and spirit, bone and marrow, thought and intention, to find out who we really are, mess and all. And guess what? God still loves us anyways. God already knows us and wants to keep knowing us. God still wants us to be part of the family. God doesn't want us to give up. God doesn't want us to hide. God doesn't expect perfection. So maybe, actually, we can benefit from a little melting down so we can have a softer, more malleable heart. Maybe God calls us to do just this. So I was was preparing for this sermon, and I was thinking about what the readings were trying to tell me, what God was trying to tell me through them, and how this theme of melting down and having a softer heart to parallel my own life. And I wanted to share this. For the past few weeks, I've been taking a course called Animating Anti-Racism and Faith Formation. It was developed for the UCC um, by Crossroads Anti-Racism Organizing and Training. And the six-week course seeks to frame anti-racism and explore how it challenges the church to reckon with its investment and white dominance and systemic racism. It's very, it's heavy stuff, hard conversations. And throughout this course, the cohort facilitators and I have been engaged in conversations about white dominant theologies and beliefs that we have been taught, that we have inherited, and that we still see and or perpetuate in our work as ministers. The work of this course intends to melt our hearts a little each time that we meet. Let me explain what that means. The creators of animating anti-racism strongly believe that being anti-racist isn't just checking off boxes of shoulds, like, oh, I guess I should read this book I saw in the New York Times, or I should attend this panel discussion, or I should learn the right words to speak about racism, and once I get enough checked off, then I'll be, I'll be different. It's not really like that. It's not really how it works. Crossroads believes that anti-racism is rather a way of being. This is where the more malleable heart is needed. They believe we must melt our heart and create a new way of being in our ideology, our theology, and our behavior that guide our innermost beliefs and outermost interactions with the world. Anti-racism, they say, is a way of being that systematically undoes these seven mindsets. Dominance, perfection, individualization, 
competition, scarcity, disposability, and secrecy. Do any of these sound familiar? Maybe how you were raised, what you were taught in school, the way that you compete with coworkers or want to win? Crossroads said that these mindsets have been mistakenly taught to us as the keys to success in the United States, but they don't keep us safer. They don't connect us deeper or get us closer to our authentic selves. Here's what they actually do. They serve to keep power concentrated where power already is, the dominant social group. And these mindsets are anti-kingdom. These mindsets hurt everyone and actively perpetuate varied, complicated, and all too common supremacy in our own institutions, our relationships, and in ourselves. They say that there is only one right way to live, to believe, and to act. They discourage messiness, the messiness that the psalmist writes of, nuance, and holding multiple truths and realities all at once, and asking for help. The mindsets of supremacy actually discourage us from being who God already knows us to be. Remember Hebrews? Dominance, perfection, individualization, competition, scarcity, disposability, and secrecy. These are, you could say, the seven sins of supremacist thinking. Do you struggle with one of these more than the others? I know I personally have the hardest time with perfection. I want to know when and how to say and do the right things. I worry every day if I'm moral or ethical enough. I sometimes stop myself from stretching outside of my comfort zone or taking even small risks because I'm afraid I'll fail and my veneer of competence and strength will shatter. I can be quick to correct others and try to persuade them to my perspective, which of course is the right one. And my fear of imperfection has led me in the past to isolate myself, to push away hard feelings, to hide from discomfort, even when, especially when, I feel as drained and disjointed and melted as the psalmist and in need of God's living and active word, as the epistler writes. So that's why I need this course. That's why I want to practice the messy work of melting and reshaping my heart into one that reflects the values I really want to live out, not the values that supremacist culture have taught me. I believe these texts are calling us to a God that wants to embrace the mess. And when the mess gets overwhelming or too much for us to handle, I believe God wants us to, as Hebrews writes, confidently approach the throne of grace whenever we need it. That's why it's there. God wants us to find our authentic selves, to feel everything that we feel, to do hard things like subverting and rejecting supremacist thinking, to do brave and kingdom-seeking things like asking for help and committing ourselves to an anti-racist way of being that touches every part of our lives. And one way we can start to explore our commitment to a heart-melting way of being is to honor Indigenous Peoples Day, not just for this weekend, but for the long term. So I invite you to think about the ways supremacist culture has infiltrated your mind, told you narratives about ownership, who belongs in or on certain land, migration. Think about the ways this culture has impacted your country, state, city, town, your friends, your family of origin. What are some of the ways that you could melt your heart chip away at these narratives to undo the supremacist ideology and behavior inside of you. Beyond your everyday life, try for yourself to consider what it would even mean to deconstruct your theology, to decolonize your theology. When you worship or meditate on God, what are the ways that you can ask God to intervene and melt your heart and take away the learned sins of supremacy? So friends, in honor of Indigenous Peoples Weekend and to close this portion of our worship, I wanted to bring to you the words of peace from Stephen Charleston. He's an author, retired American Episcopal bishop, and citizen of the Choctaw people, uh, nation of Oklahoma. 
And you can find this reflection in a few different places, but I found it in one of his newer books called Ladder to the Light, an Indigenous Elder's Meditation on Hope and Courage. This is called An Offering of Peace. I have achieved few things in my life worth noting, but one thing I have achieved is important, not because of what it reflects about me, but because of what it may offer to you. I am a person at peace, at peace with myself, at peace with the world around me. All my faults are intact and fully apparent, but deep in my spirit's core, I am a calm soul. What does that mean? According to the ancient tradition, it means that I have something I can share. The peace I feel is not something I am to keep, but to give away. So please receive the one true thing of value that I can give, this offering of peace for your life. May we make peace with our messiness. May God grant us the peace of mercy. May we confidently approach the throne of grace and radical love and hospitality towards others and ourselves. May our hearts be known and melted for God's reforming. May our way of being change here, now, for the better and for God. Amen.